Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Chilvers. I'm the uh, field crop pathologist uh, here at Michigan State. Um, so, yeah, this morning we'll talk a little bit about striper. Um, so, as Martin mentioned, that was a really big, big issue this year, right? Um, how many of you did see striper in some of your fields or, or neighbours' fields? Forty odd percent or so, right? So it's patchy, but in some fields it's really quite bad, okay? Um, and as Martin was just beginning to talk about there as well, the timing of when it came in was, was much earlier than what we normally see, right? Um, so this photo on the left-hand side is of some seedlings. Uh, that was taken by uh, John Rush of BASF. Um, and I believe that was up in the thumb. I don't know if John is here today. Um, that was sent to me, um, you know, the beginning of May there, and that was May 2nd that he took that photo. And initially I didn't think it was stripe rust. And why didn't I think it was stripe rust? Any, any guesses? Too early. Yeah, too early, yep. What, what else about that, the symptoms? We call it stripe rust because of the stripes, right? But on seedlings, um, you don't really get that really characteristic striping pattern, right? So it looks a little bit more like the common leaf rust, which just occurs randomly across the leaf. So I was a little bit tricked uh, when I first saw that photo and sort of questioned what it was. So we got that sample into the lab um, and had a closer look at the spores and I worked with Jan Burn on just confirming what it was. So under the microscope though, you can see that these um, the pustules line up and later in the season when we look at the stripe rust out there today, you'll, you'll see you know, the classics of the stripe rust, right? So that's, that's how you can identify this disease. The other characteristic is the colour um, of, of the pustules. They're very yellow to light orange. And in fact, this, this picture here is probably a little bit darker than what it really is, just, just based on the, the way the camera took the photo. And these pustules um, you know, form within the, the leaf tissue themselves and then bust open and then release all of these uh, uridia spores that, that continue the cycle, right? And rust, in general, are diseases that, that um, reproduce very quickly and they can be very devastating. Um, so, yeah, possibly, you know, why we've seen so much more uh, disease this year is that very early occurrence of, of stripe rust, right? Normally, it's the beginning of June or very late May when we start to see things developing. Um, so, some other factors that have probably really contributed this year um, have been the conditions. Um, so stripe rust is favoured by cool nights, uh, less than 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and we've certainly had plenty of those this season, right? It really hasn't warmed up much. Um, and although it's been pretty dry, um, you know, we have had dew events um, overnight, uh, and it only requires about six hours of moisture for, for reinfection of the plant. So infection and disease development are very rapid at these cooler 50 to 60 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. And just in terms of that symptomology again and what you're seeing out there in the fields, here's an adult um, leaf where you can see the very classic stripes, right? The, the stripe rust. Um, and then what we're also seeing this year, because we've got so much disease pressure, you're actually seeing a second stage of the wheat rust. Okay, rusts are pretty complicated in their lifestyle. They've got a lot of different um, spore stages. And so on these older lesions, we're starting to see some of these little black spots on the leaves, right? And they're the telia. It's just a secondary spore stage, okay? So there's this orange um, uridia spores that, that's causing a lot of the um, epidemic that we're seeing this year. This is just to show you how complicated the, the life cycle is, and you certainly don't need to remember any of this. So the stage that we're really talking about is this stage here where you've got that, that orange or yellow rust on the leaves, right? And you're getting a lot of cycles. It's very... Uh, you go through a lot of different cycles in a year, and, and that's why we see it develop so quickly. Then we're starting to see the formation of these tilia. Uh, they release tilia spores, which form another spore stage, the basidio spores. And then it actually transitions um, onto barberry as an alternative host. Um, and you might remember those barberry eradication programs back 20, 30 years ago. Do you guys remember those? No? Nope. Some of you, kind of do? You had the highest population of barberry plants in the 1920s. There you go. Yeah, that's all the one. We didn't find any last year. So. Right, right, absolutely. So, and the big concern there was um, stem rust, 
right? That, that, was, that was really a concern. So that, that other rust um, on wheat, stem rust, really removing this barberry so that we don't have the overwintering ability. And we don't know at the moment whether um, we're seeing any overwintering on, on barberry in Michigan. And even if it is overwintering, does that really contribute much to, to the disease? So that's one of the questions that we need to look at. Okay, so it goes through barberry and then it will reinfect wheat and then continue the disease cycle. Okay. So where did the striper rust come from? So did it overwinter this last year due to the mild conditions? That's, that's the potential um, thing that happened, right? Is it potentially overwintering on barberry? We don't know that either. And certainly a lot of the rust, uh, including common rust on corn, can, you know, blow up from the south every year. Right? They need that living host. So thankfully with our Michigan winters, you know, most, of the, um, most of those hosts die off and so we don't really have overwintering. Um, and so a lot of the, the different rust diseases of different crops you know, overwinter down south and then, then move up. And so that, that might be another potential source um, of this disease. Um, so that's something we're working on and there's a guy at Colorado State University actually um, that um, Andrew from Eric's program and Dennis has collected samples and sent those to Colorado. We're doing some, um, some analysis of the different uh, rust genotypes to figure out where did it come from. Right? Um, I don't know if, if Eric wants to say something about this. Do you want to come up here, Eric? Use the mic maybe. So, of course, you know, we weren't really expecting this stripe rust. They do a lot of work on stripe rust out in the Pacific Northwest because it's an annual issue out there. Um, Eric and uh, his crew made good use of the, the epidemic this year to do some raiding. And we've done some trials on campus too, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute soon. So we have very accurate ratings this year. We have, uh, we have two replications in that, uh, no, three replications in Ingham County, and then just up the road, uh, north of the, the Star facility there. And so we can see, we've classified these into different categories, uh, highly resistant, moderately resistant, moderately susceptible, and susceptible. And those, those have strong implications in, in terms of whether they need to be managed and, and how, how intensively they need to be managed. So lines like Agrimax 413, you might remember that from a few minutes ago, it's highly resistant. So these lines retain over 95% of their flag leaf area under heavy disease pressure. Now, as we move into the moderately resistant class, you know, some highlights, Red Dragon, even Jupiter has, is moderately resistant. I don't know if maybe we can probably see that out in Paul's uh, fields out front here. Uh, those, those can lose up to 40% of their plague leaf area. So there's some resistance, but it's not as strong and immediate as the highly resistant lines. And definitely the moderately susceptible and susceptible lines, uh, you can see lines like Ambassador um, and Shirley, Aubrey, Hopewell, and others um, are either susceptible or even moderately susceptible lines. They still need a, a fungicide application to manage, to manage disease to retain that flag leaf. Thanks, Eric. Uh, and so this just brings up the good point, you know, of making sure we use resistance, selecting varieties in terms of management. And normally, you know, we'd probably be focusing on head scab as our primary issue. And honestly, we're really not too sure if strike rust is going to be an issue next year or maybe not for another 20 years, right? We're gonna, unfortunately, we'll have to sort of wait and see on that. Martin, did you have any other comments on just distribution across the state you wanted to share? I was gonna switch over to fungicides next. Um, this is actually a good uh, question for this group and maybe it'd be interesting to map this uh, where the concentration is. Uh, Lee Seiler and, and others and have been seeing it, I think, in all your sites this year, all five locations. Um, and I think that's, um, and that speaks to the fact that this disease has been developing for a long time. Since beginning when we started getting uh, um, comments from pathologists on the southern, uh, southern states, the spores have been building and building until it walks its way across the country and lands in Michigan, not exclusively, but it seems that way. But uh, so it's not any surprise there. It is still a surprise, but we started seeing it the first two days of May um, in the thumb. Um, that's still a, a real question. And this is a disease that we didn't see, I didn't see any last year. Did you? At very low levels and it came in late. 
very late and very low levels. Quite often, in fact, Lee, I, I think Lee told me that the best, only time he was able to get good ratings on varieties or reasonable ratings, I think it was when, in Allegan in 2012 and 2013, we looked for opportunities to rate these varieties. This one, they scrambled and worked, I think, a whole weekend to get this for us. But uh, distribution, what's uh, strange to me, it seems to be a little bit worse where it's drier. And I don't know, I shouldn't probably say that out loud, but I think some other growers would um, notice that too. Some of the first fields that we saw, larger uh, Red Ruby Ambassador, they lost 50% of their yield potential to my eye about three weeks ago. And some of it was just north of here, um, but I've also seen fields in Shepherds and maybe some other, other area. So um, certainly across the state, and probably some of the worst is in the central part of Michigan, but I have not observed the southern um, tier of state or counties. Thank you. Um, so we mentioned resistance a little bit here, and of course, uh, you know, fungicides are also used. Um, you know, we, we typically would recommend those for head scab management. Um, so on campus, this is in East Lansing, we have a, a number of different fungicide trials set up, right? Uh, and I'm really glad we did, and we obviously weren't expecting this dry frost epidemic to come through. Uh, but when it has come through, we've been able to take advantage of that and go out and do some ratings to look at how those different fungicide timings perform. Um, so this is Ambassador um, on campus, and you can see a control um, plot here on the left-hand side, very heavy disease pressure, all the yellow leaves in there. And then a Stratego yield application at FIX9, and from what I've seen on, on campus at least, the FIX9 application seems to be the best timing for, for this dry frost epidemic, at, at least at this location, right? We also have some FIX6 uh, applications, which are probably a little bit early, not really protecting as much of that flag leaf, of course, uh, maybe slowing down the, the disease a little bit in those plots, but FIX9 seemed to be about the, the best performing uh, trial. Um, so we'll have a, a, a lot of data at the end of this year with respect to fungicide application control and, and how, how that helps save yield, right? Um, we've also set up uh, with Martin a, a rescue trial because we were getting a lot of questions when, you know, when, when growers were finding fields that were really heavily infested. You know, when is it too late, right? And so we've done these trials where we're going in and spraying um, multiple times um, with a couple of different fungicide products to come back and then see you know, if, if this happens next year and you're in a situation where disease sort of gets away from you in a field, you know, when, when do we draw the line and not put any more product on, okay? Um, does anyone have any other comments on strike rust? I'll switch gears a little bit, or any questions, sorry? Yep. Was the, the last slide? Um, I think it was a four ounce rate, I believe. Yep, yep, I'm getting a nod from Adam too. Adam put that on. So I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. And I could I could just double check that for you for sure. Please. Um, it, you know, after harvest, there's always lots of volunteer wheat and that's a potential disease location. And to what extent is that a concern as sort of a relay uh, if it extends into the fall to a newly planted wheat in, in, the, in the year. Absolutely. So Steve's asking the question about, you know, really heavily infested wheat, if, if that's left to sort of volunteer, how much of a risk is that going to be? Uh, I guess particularly for strike rust, right? Or, or any disease. Okay, so we had a really good example of that um, on campus, actually. So we had a, a volunteer wheat field uh, just across the road from, our, from this trial. And we had uh, wheat streak mosaic virus come in uh, from that uh, volunteer wheat, and that's carried on uh, the wheat um, curl mite um, insect vectored, right? So absolutely, I mean, I think take care of that volunteer wheat is a very good idea. There, there are a lot of viruses that can be carried over, um, barley yellow dwarf virus as well. In terms of stripe rust, if we have a hard winter, it's probably not going to be an issue, right? We don't really expect it to be overwintering significantly. If we get another really light winter, then perhaps that'll, that'll help um, that potential for, for overwintering. 
Any other questions? Yes. So, and if there's volunteer week that comes up at Scott Club, and if you take and fill it out with Roundup, would that? Oh, so if it comes up with Rust on it, um, and fill out with Roundup volunteer stuff. Um, yeah, you, you, you probably could. I mean, if you're already seeing Rust on the wheat, it's probably already releasing spores. So that's probably the catch with that. Um, you know, I, I guess we don't normally think of this as sort of overwintering here in Michigan, right? And we're really at a loss as to explain exactly where this came from. But certainly, I guess if we have a really mild winter, it might be a good idea just to burn those fields off early. Yep, absolutely. Martin's got something to add to that. Yeah, we're, we're new at this. My, my reaction would be maybe just a little different. That doesn't, I don't mean to, um, I think the spores are so um, abundant that the, 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 the disease in your volunteer wheat, I don't think it would change my management practice. And I'm guessing, so we have a, maybe a contrast here. But if you're using wheat for your cover crop program, um, would I go out of my way to kill that off early? Um, I would not. Um, we have so much inoculum across the country just waiting. It's, a, it's much more about the winter, winter conditions. Now we would, like, or, uh, we would like to hear from you in your new seedings this fall. We'd really like to talk to you about that. If you're growing a very susceptible variety and you're seeing it in your new seedings, I'd like to talk. Um, I don't want to see it in there. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Any question up the back there? Any effect on the seed next year? Effect, effect on seed. Um, it's, Martin doesn't think so. <laughs> um, I mean, apart, apart from potentially affecting seed size, right? I mean, if we're shutting down the plant, of course, it's going to affect quality in that sense. Um, but it's, it's, as far as we know, it's not, you know, it's not seed transmitted, so that's not really an issue. Any questions? Okay, so let's talk about head scab for a little bit then. Um, and again, Martin, if you want to jump in at any time, feel free to do so. I've just got two slides, I think. Um, so this is the head scab prediction model. Um, so of course, this year, everything's green, right? Do you guys know about this model? No, some of you don't. Anyway, so this is, that's the address, the website address um, on the top of the screen there. And it's really to give you a sense of how, how you know, what's the risk, right? So last year, I think that we're a little bit behind um, behind things in terms of the model, right? So it was it was presenting pretty low risk for, for quite a period of time, and then suddenly turned red, right? And of course, we had very high scab pressure. So that's one of the things that we're working on as well. These are multi-state efforts. Um, so we're doing spray trials, um, basically spraying and not spraying, and having a look at how much uh, head scab develops sending all of that data to Ohio State, where they're going to go through and then pull data from across uh, the Midwest here and try and improve this model. Because we want to have the most accurate model that we can uh, to help you make a risk management decision. And in terms of, if you're just trying to figure out what all this means, um, so here you can plug in different forecast hours for today and, and uh, three days out. Uh, green just means we're at very low risk, right? Orange means we're at medium risk, and red, we're at very high risk. And obviously, if we're at very high risk, it's probably a very good idea to go out and make that application uh, to control head scab. And so, um, the last couple of years, there's been this uh, multi-state effort to look at the timing for head scab management, right? So, you know, five years ago, if you'd asked us when to put that fungicide on, we would have said right at the very beginning of flowering. So the last couple of years across multiple states, we've looked at that timing window, okay? And so we've looked at right at the beginning of flowering, which is when 50% of the heads have flowers on them, um, and then plus two, four, and six days beyond that, that uh, beginning of flowering. And basically, we've, we've, we've seen that, you know, from the beginning of flowering through to about six days uh, post the beginning of flowering, we get pretty good protection um, from head scab. You go outside of that window, nine days or thereabouts from the beginning of flowering, you start to lose your protection pretty quickly. So this second generation of SCAD trials is really to look at um, splitting applications. So we've got Prosaro, 
uh, at flowering, which is our standard sort of recommendation. And then we've got, this is an expensive program, of course, Prosalo followed by Carumba four days later, and then Carumba followed by Follicure uh, four days after the flowering, and um, Proline and Follicure. So we've got these treatments out there being done across multiple locations. So Martin Nagelkirk's doing that up here in the thumb. We're doing this on campus um, to look at how these split applications might provide some, some better, better head scab control, especially in those years like last year where we get a lot of uh, disease pressure. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, I guess just the other point to make um, is just a request for samples. Um, so in terms of head scab, there's actually a few subspecies of the head scab fungus, right, that cause disease. And so I've got a student, uh, Michaela Brunig, she's here somewhere, over there, she's waving her hand. She'd very much like to have samples um, if you get any head scab uh, this year. If you get some head scab in your wheat and would like us to come out and sample that and test the fungicide sensitivity, please let us know, especially where you feel the product is not working very well. And the idea of this is really to have a look at what subspecies are out there causing disease, their chemotype profile, that is the toxins that they're producing, and then their fungicide sensitivity. Right? So in terms of those fungicides I just talked about, how well do these fungicides work in killing the, the pathogen? Right? We're going to do that in the lab to just sort of ask the question, where are we in terms of fungicide resistance? Right?